I'm Dorothy Palmer. My lecture is Vulnerability and Memoir, Personal Risk and Literary Payoff. I've been around Spalding for a while. You may not recognize me because my class graduated six or so years ago. I decided to take the 10-year plan to an MFA. During that time, I became a life coach and an Equus coach. This is how I became interested in Brene Brown's work on vulnerability. I am here to tell you, you're going to love this lecture. It is truly awesome. And it is going to suck, really suck. It's awesome because I'm going to open up to you, to the, open you up to the power of vulnerability in your life and in your writing. I believe to write with vulnerability helps to live with vulnerability. And it'll be awesome, life-changing when you get on board and live vulnerably. Powerful things will change in your life. You'll be able to communicate better with your partners and peers. You'll rid yourself of toxic friends and know it's okay. And you'll recognize shame for what it is and not be debilitated by it. You'll write fearlessly and your work will be captivating and meaningful. And this lecture will suck. Deciding to open your heart to the fear and feel it anyway is not for the meek. You'll try it and feel pain and retreat behind your armor. We all do. You'll face feelings of failure in the same way we felt <clears throat> when we first started riding and sucked at that. Remember when your best workshop pieces were kindly, gently, caringly critiqued? Still hurt. Maybe not as much at Spalding as somewhere else, but these pieces are our babies. They are perfect in every way, only they aren't. And we know it, and we want to help. And we want help, but instead of hardening our hearts to take the criticism, we open our hearts to hear what we need to know. And it sucks, but we come to understand it isn't personal. I wrote my thesis as a memoir. Now, having recovered from the process of deleting everything I loved, i.e. felt safe to tell, and condensing everything I hated, i.e. felt sickened by, at least for the first 20 readings, I, felt I, have a I feel I have a compelling story. In the writing of my thesis, I discovered that the vulnerable moments in my book were by far the best written and the most interesting. I'm not sure why this is true, why I write better when I'm in immersed in a sad, disappointing, or scary part of my life. Aside from the inherent drama of it, <clears throat> I think it may be that somehow I drop out of my ego and I write from the heart. Since it's just between me and the computer screen, much as I do when I journal, I become honest. My lecture is on vulnerability and memoir, writing about oneself in an honest way, without dodging facts that are uncomfortable or feelings that incriminate us, expressing thoughts as authentically as one can, considering the perspective is from the inside looking out including situations and backstories that you may not tell your mother or best friend. It just makes for a better story, one that readers will read, a story that will sell because it has a quality readers are looking for. Marion Roach Smith explains it best in this quote. When we make ourselves vulnerable by writing about our own shame, we give readers what they desire most from memoir, <clears throat> to discover their own essential okayness, their own humanity. You may have heard Pat Conroy, the South Carolina writer who writes in his memoir, The Water is Wide, open and honestly about what it is like growing up in the South before and after the civil rights movement from a white man's perspective. Maybe it struck a chord with your confusion around race when you were young. 
It did me. I have two passages from The Water is Wide. Here is the first. Sometimes it's good for me to reflect on the Neanderthal part period of my youth when I rode in the back seat of a 57 Chevrolet along a night blackened Carolina road hunting for blacks to hit with rotten watermelons tossed from the window of the speeding car as they walked the shoulder of the thin back roads. Do you feel the embarrassment Conroy might have felt admitting to this in the public forum of a memoir? Does it sicken or anger you? Does it make him seem a little more human, less perfect and vulnerable? Here's another passage from Conroy's memoir. <clears throat> White guilt, that nasty little creature that, who rested on my left shoulder, prevented me from challenging Mrs. Brown on this or any other point. At this time of my life, a black man could probably have handed me a bucket of cow piss commanded me to drink it in order that I might rid my soul of the stench of racism and I would have only asked for a straw. Blacks who have gone through the civil rights struggle have met hundreds of boys, young white boys and girls who would dive headfirst into a septic tank to prove their liberation from the sins of their fathers. I thought Mrs. Brown was wrong but did not have the moral courage to tell her so. And the fantasy of the races conceived in my mind <clears throat> all blacks were noble people who had struggled against a repressive or social order for years and were who, for, who were finally reaping the tangible rewards of the struggle. All whites, especially myself, were guilty of heinous, extraordinarily brutal crimes against humanity. It dawned on me that when I came to Yamakra for it dawned on me that I came to Yamakra for a fallacious reason. I needed to be cleansed, born again, resurrected by good works and suffering, purified by the dark cankers that grew like toadstools in my past. I was on the island for expiation, and I think I like to watch Joe and Jim struggle so patiently because I saw in them a reflection of me. It's clear in his book Conroy's early racism was based on ignorance and peer pressure. As he began to develop his own ideas of community, his attitude morphed in advocacy for equality among races. But by including this, that very personal passage, he bared his soul and became vulnerable. That passage gripped me as a Southerner raised in the same era as Conroy, conflicted by my own early fear and confusion around racism. I remember thinking, finally, someone has had the guts to write the truth. It endeared him to me as a person and gave humanity to his story. Before going any further, what is vulnerability? The definition is changing, so I'm going to present several evolutions of the word vulnerable. In the Oxford English Dictionary, one definition of vulnerable is exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. In Merriam-Webster's thesaurus, synonyms are defenseless, susceptibility, and weakness. Brene Brown, a PhD in sociology, has studied vulnerability for more than a decade, and she believes vulnerability is not weakness, that, the definition, that that definition is a myth. She writes in her book, Daring Greatly, when we spend our lives pushing away and protecting ourselves from feeling vulnerable, we feel contempt for others. We feel contempt when others are less capable. We've come to the point where we'd rather than where rather than respecting and appreciating the courage and daring behind vulnerability, we let our fear and discomfort become judgment and criticism. Brown defines vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. She goes on to point out that to put our art, our writing, our photography, our ideas out into the world with no assurance of acceptance or appreciation, that's also vulnerability. 
This is what you feel when you present at workshop, vulnerable. Your art, your heart, is laid open for all to see. Outside the trusting environment of Spalding, you become uncertain how your work will be received. You took the risk to present it in the first place and now you are emotionally exposed. Do you feel this right now? <laughs> that scary little bit of nerve racking dread that something terrible might happen? You might get hurt and yet you do it anyway. That is living vulnerably. The payoff is that something terrible usually does not happen, but often you get really great feedback. <clears throat> you go on to improve your piece and present it at graduation, proudly. And you share a part of you that is unlike anyone else, your uniqueness. This is what we have to offer the world. Another example of writing vulnerably is Martha Beck in her book, Leaving the Saints. In Beck's book on her decision to leave the Mormon church and subsequent journey into her childhood memories, ultimately remembering her father and molesting her at five, she speaks openly about how the memory affected her sexual experience with her husband. I quote, I began to understand something that had always baffled me, why so many people would rather be alive than dead. I think this had everything to do with sex. Like Virginia Woolf, I numbed everything connected to sensuality, to physical sensation, and because I associated it with trauma, I numbed everything connected to sens sensuality, to physical sensation, because I associated it with trauma. But feeling is a package deal. And when a person avoids all things sexual, the ability to experience physical pleasure in any form becomes a ghost of its former self. Due to early therapy and John's patience as a lover, I'd managed to have an acceptable sex life before I remembered my childhood. But it had always been somewhat frustrating. I could, I could feel present either physically or emotionally but never both at once. Now, my body, mind, and heart seem to be reconnecting. Not, not only was being with John more dramatically, dramatically more satisfying, I felt as though I were making love with the universe all day, every day. In another Martha Beck book, Expecting Adam, Beck finds she is pregnant with a Down syndrome child while getting her PhD at Harvard. In this environment, where intellect is valued over all other traits, Beck was forced to consider that a person's value must be more than quantifiable intelligence because she valued her son equally to her intelligent daughter. I quote, with my fears all boil, what my fears all boiled down to as I sat with my tiny orange son in the days after his birth, was an underlying terror that he would destroy my own facade. The flawlessness and invulnerability I projected onto the big screen, the great and terrible Martha of Oz. You see, I knew all along that there wasn't one label people might apply to Adam, stupid, ugly, clumsy, strange, slow, inept, that could not, at one time or another, be justifiably applied to me. I had spent my life running from this catastrophe, and like so many other things, it caught up with me while I was expecting Adam. When authors are painfully honest in their writing, the result is often a quickening of the heart, a quickening of the blood in the reader. Perhaps a psychic cringing when reading something one may have thought but never said openly. And yet there follows a moment of relief or satisfaction that it is out in the open now. Perhaps a synchronizing of thoughts that validates the reader's own feelings, making them feel not quite so alone. As Brene Brown says, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all women 
men and children. Here's the question. Can we do this and what will it take? Can we be vulnerable when we are discussing important questions with our family? Can we reveal our deepest shame in our memoir and call it our own? Can we lean into pain and experience it just as it is without judgment and self-abuse? We can. Not all at once. It's a skill to be improved and we will backslide and that's okay too. Because every step along our journey, it is okay to feel the way we're feeling. This is the very message our readers want to hear too. They want to be shown how it worked in other people's lives, how they got there, where they slipped up, and how they recovered. So where do we begin? I'll tell a secret I had to learn the hard way. I was taking a 10-day course in consciousness training 10 years ago, and I was really resisting the feeling of the sadness of my depression. I didn't want to go there. It would be far too painful, and I felt I might die. I was crying and in a great deal of emotional pain just thinking about it. And then the secret was revealed to me. The pain of resistance to feeling an emotion or a memory is much worse than the pain of feeling the emotion or, a mem or memory. I'll repeat that. The pain of resistance to feeling an emotion or memory is much worse than the feeling of the emotion or memory. In other words, resistance to feeling is 90% more painful than feeling. When you can drop your resistance and just stick your big toe in to the emotion or memory, you discover it's not nearly as bad as you expected it to be. Then you take your big toe out and you go about your business until you think about it again. Stick your big toe in, in other words, feel the pain for about 10 seconds or so and then stop. Every time you drop the resistance and experiencing, experience something fully, you reduce the pain of it. Think of it as a lake of sadness. Experiencing that sadness slowly drains the lake. As humans, we yearn to experience. There is a saying, what you resist will persist. On the other side of that coin is what you experience will process and integrate. You embrace. It is worth investing in feeling a little pain, knowing it'll help reducing it, reduce it over time. It is the very basis of talk therapy, I believe. So how do we become more vulnerable? The first step is to practice in a safe place. When the ego feels safe, it goes to sleep, allowing our forebrain to take over and rule wisely and rationally. When the ego is triggered, it shuts down the rational forebrain and makes important decisions for us. The ego keeps us safe through fight or flight. It's the lizard brain, the amygdala, the lump at the top of our brainstem that is our ancient brain. Fight or flight can look like becoming defensive, being argumentative, or being silent, hiding while secretly harboring resentment. The ego is great for keeping us from accidentally and stepping in front of a bus, but mostly I want my larger, more developed forebrain to be in charge. This might require me to offer my little-minded lizard brain a grape and tell it to go back to sleep, that I've got this. This is an idea Martha Beck, mother of life coaching, recommends in her life coaching course. We step in and decide rationally that we are being triggered by some past event and question the reality of the threat. Is it true I'm an idiot? No, I wrote an ECE last semester. I'm getting my MFA. So the second step is to collect evidence that what the thoughts in your mind are telling you are not true. The ego likes to prove that its beliefs are true. So it collects evidence to prove them. It doesn't collect any other kind of evidence, just the evidence to prove itself right. Byron Katie came up with a great technique, 
to disputing beliefs. She created what she calls the work, and there's an app for it. When a thought or problem arises that triggers mental sabotage, question the thought. Is it true? In what ways is it not true? In Katie's systematic formula, we look for evidence contrary to the belief. Up to nine examples will put that lizard brain right back to bed. Threat averted, one point for the forebrain. The third step to becoming more vulnerable is to be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be as kind to yourself as you are to a child, a pet, a plant, or whatever you love the most. Treat yourself as kindly as you treat others by self-talk. For every incriminating thought that may pop into your head out of habit, negate it by simply saying to yourself, it's okay, you're not perfect, you're human. I get more mileage from using the I am just human statement to myself than any other flattery because all I have to do is look around and see that humans are not perfect. We are all still struggling. We are projects in progress. Mentally, speak kindly to yourself, as you might a small child with great compassion. Give yourself a little mental pat on the back. Uh, there, there, it'll be okay. You aren't perfect. I began this practice and found it took an entire year to switch over from derogatory statements to healing statements, but I was successful and I'm much happier. To recap, the three steps towards living the heartfelt life of vulnerability. One, practice being vulnerable in a safe place, like Spalding. Two, question your thoughts by asking, is it true? And three, develop positive self-talk. Are they easy steps? No. The irony of vulnerability as Brene Brown discovers, is that, and I quote, in the, it's the first thing I want to see in you and the last thing I want you to see in me. In you, it's courage. In me, it's inadequacy. In you, it's lovability. In me, it's shame. How do we take this practice into our writing? Start by finding a secret and writing about it. If a secret is embarrassing, that's a good place to begin. As you write, you may realize someone already knows the secret and it's not really a secret. You may come to discover that a lot of people probably guessed and that you just like to think it's a secret. Why did you choose that particular secret if it's not even that much of a secret? Could it be the ego slipped in to protect you from revealing something truly painful? or at least what the ego perceived to be painful? Highly likely, I'm afraid. This is where we dig deeper. You might now be thinking, this sucks. You might be asking yourself, why would I ever want to become vulnerable? What do I get out of it? Because being vulnerable brings us together. In Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection, she explains that it is a sense of connection that makes life meaningful. Sharing feelings with another on this level feels like we are being seen and heard, and therefore we feel valued, fulfilling our need for belonging. Search for memories, secrets, and hidden agendas that bring a shame response, and journal about it first. Determine whether they really are secrets, whether you really are ashamed of them or have time and exposure mollified them. If you go deeper to the next level, to the event or thought that you never shared, I'm sorry, if so, go deeper. Feel what it feels like to share it and write about that feeling. Why is it so scary? What are you afraid of revealing about yourself? How can shedding light on it bring you closer to what it means to be human. This is your true work, digging deep, and it is not for the faint-hearted. It is the hero's journey, and just when things start to resolve, another test rises up. 
Brown writes, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy. The experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. Put your explorer's cap on and venture on because this is what it, this is. It's an adventure. Looking for secrets and hidden agendas that you've stuffed down but that still require attention to keep secret. Imagine bringing all of your secrets and hidden agendas into the light of day. Imagine how many attention particles will be released because you don't have to hold that secret anymore. Those attention particles will become available to you to create what you desire instead of being tied up with what you resist. It's a win-win in the end. As writers, we write to be heard, which can make writing vulnerably difficult. I suggest to write to create, not to publish. Write to portray a story as you know how it happened, with intent to never let anyone read it. I nicknamed my piece the memoir that will never be read, and it may never be, but not because I wasn't vulnerable, but because it was about my family and my husband and my children. In the end, as I edited, I found the truth of the story more pure, more universal, and more important. And if, it, if I weren't in the same situation and my sons weren't still youngish, I might publish it. I am definitely glad I wrote it. To embark on your journey to living vulnerably, begin in a safe environment, question your thoughts, are they true, and develop positive self-talk. To embark on your journey to writing vulnerably, look for secrets that make you feel shame and explore them. Write first about, your, about the feelings and then about why you feel that way. Discover the root of the shame and expose it for what it is, a cultural standard, a childhood belief that no longer applies, a deep-rooted fear that just by changing your perspective will disappear. Then let your freedom flag fly and write unabashedly with great vulnerability. Your readers will love you for your courage and keep reading on to discover where it took you and then maybe someday we'll take them. I'd like to close on a quote by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. The power of the written word is that you can craft it to make someone feel. A fee perhaps a feeling they may have otherwise denied. Use that power for good. Thank you.